is uh, Philippe Rushton. He's probably best known as the author of Race, Evolution, Behavior. And this book sets forth what I think is a brilliantly original theory about the meaning and the nature of racial differences. Of course, uh, uh, as our uh, attendee was pointing out earlier, the Canadian authorities are such that uh, the brilliantness and the originality of this book did not stop Canadian customs from stopping at the border and examining it for a full nine months to determine whether or not it was hate literature. Of course, many of you are familiar with the hysterical opposition that met Professor Rushton's work. And that hysteria, I'm happy to say, although once again I'll knock on wood, has largely subsided. I think uh, what happens is that the people who scream finally, believe it or not, get tired of screaming. Race, evolution, and behavior is now available in paperback, and interestingly enough, it's also been translated into Japanese. Those of you who have read it would suspect, I think, that Japanese would find it to be an extremely interesting book. Uh, Professor Rushton is now working on a popular abridged edition of Race, Evolution, and Behavior, which should put it into the hands of a much, much broader readership. Of course, this book is only one of Professor Rushton's six books. He's written hundreds of scholarly papers. He is a professor of psychology at the University of Western Ontario in Canada, and among his many, many honors, he is a fellow of the John Simon Guggenheim Foundation. He has lectured at dozens of universities and scientific conventions, appeared on many, many radio and television programs, and those of you who attended the last American Renaissance Conference will recall that his talk was something of the highlight of the entire program. And so it is a great honor and a great pleasure for me to introduce to you Professor Philip Rushton. <laughs> My thesis today is that the human desire for a sense of ethnic identity is part of human nature. Uh, it evolves out of the same sense of altruistic genes as does this, the need for a family and a family structure and is part of social organization. Uh, it evolved in order to replicate genes more effectively, which is what evolution is all about. So political scientists completely get it backwards and is absolutely wrong when they say that uh, ethnic identity and nationalism is um, not compatible with being modern, that it's an infantile throwback, that it is some kind of mental abnormality or social pathology, uh, as, I, as I hope to show. I'm going to start off with some relatively anecdotal um, uh, material, then move into some more technical science and uh, then uh, refer back to uh, the implications for ethnic identity. Uh, so if I can have the first slide. I want to start off with um, Nelson Mandela. Uh, this is his autobiography. And if you read uh, his autobiography, uh, Nelson Mandela defines himself as a member of the Zoxa tribe, which is one of the largest Bantu tribes in South Africa. Uh, one of the tribes that uh, Professor Whitney was telling us about this morning. But if you look at his features closely, especially around the eyes, you will see an epicanthic fold, which is unique and specific to Bushmen. And so it looks as though there is some admixture in Nelson Mandela's uh, ethnic heritage, part Bushman, part Zoxa. And indeed, if you look at the history of the Zoxa people, apparently when they migrated south, replacing the Bushmen, they incorporated a number of Bushmen genes into their own tribe. If you took DNA samples of Nelson Mandela, you could indeed probably determine what percentage, if any, was Bushmen, what percentage was Zoxa, and what percentage was some other uh, ethnic identity. Does it matter? I suppose you could argue that it doesn't matter in the slightest, that in the new South Africa, uh, they're all South Africans, they're all blacks, and these tribal uh, differences make no difference. But of course, I will argue that it does. Go ahead. Uh, this is Shimon Gante. Shimon Gante lives in Toronto. And uh, if you look at his features closely, you will see that he displays uh, signs of where he originated, which is in a part of India near the Burmese border. And so he looks like an interesting ethnic mix of 
East Indian, Caucasoid features, and Burmese, uh, Oriental or Mongoloid features. In fact, Shimon Gante uh, is living in Toronto and studying to be a rabbi, <laughs> the first rabbi of his tribe. We go to the next picture. This has caused a certain amount of interest in uh, Canada. This is Maclean's magazine, which is like Time or Newsweek in the States. And they ran a big story on the Jews of Asia. Shimon Gante's people could number as few as 5,000, but it could number as many as 1.5 million. And as you know, or many of you know, under the Israeli constitution, there is such a thing as the right to return. Now, I don't mean the right of Shimon Gangti as an individual to return, but presumably, although they don't know it uh, explicitly, they mean his genes, which originated in the Middle East two and a half or five thousand years ago, have the now right to return uh, in his modern descendants. And this is causing some degree of uh, interest, because if one and a half million Indians decide to go to Israel, uh, this would provide a major problem of absorption. And in fact, lost tribes are now springing up in South Africa, Ethiopia, and many other places because Israel's standard of living is rising to the level of other European nations and third world peoples want to go in. The Israeli response is interesting because some scientists there say, well, I can go out and measure Shimon Gante's DNA and see to what extent his DNA matches the DNA of modern Israeli populations. And then we can determine whether or not they're in effect Jewish and therefore have the right to return. But of course other Israelis, perhaps the majority, say well to even suggest DNA testing is absolutely racist and outrageous and uh, Jews are um, a cultural group, a self-defined religion and it's nothing to do with genetics. Well, maybe it is and maybe it isn't and we'll come back to that at the end. And my third anecdote is from a happier time of Charles and Diana. Uh, these two individuals actually look rather similar to one another. Um, they're probably distant cousins. And one interesting question is uh, in terms of uh, genetic similarity, which is what I'm talking about. Uh, some sociobiologists, evolutionists like myself, argue that these ideas that I'm talking uh, wide ethnic uh, uh, racial group solidarity based on shared genes cannot be true because you cannot preserve genes other than as an individual. And the reasons they give for this is to point to somebody like uh, the present Queen of England and say, look, the Queen of England or Prince Charles probably doesn't share a single gene in common with, say, William the Conqueror. Uh, of 1066 fame uh, because if you look at the statistics of genetic replication you share 50 percent of your genes with your parents uh, your child shares 25 percent of his genes with your parents uh, his child will share 12 and a half percent of his genes with your parent and so on so that these uh, probabilities become vanishingly small very quickly so it's quite likely that uh, Prince Charles doesn't share a single gene with uh, his great-great-great-great-grandfather, William the Conqueror. My counter-argument, and I think it's empirically true, is to say those statistics are misleading. That through cultural practices, genes have expression through culture. Through various cultural practices, for example, assortative mating, like marries like, Charles and Diana are in fact related. So there's a tendency for like to be marrying like and for groups to keep out of the gene pool uh, groups that are rather dissimilar from themselves and therefore through these kinds of cultural practices you can indeed keep a pool of genes intact over generations, over thousands of years. And so indeed if you could dig up uh, William the Conqueror's DNA and take a, a sample and match it up to uh, Prince Charles, my guess is that you would find that they were in fact quite genetically similar. Uh, but that's an empirical question. I now want to turn to some science and some stati statistics. And these are bar graphs basically with social psychologists and sociologists have put together 
from demographic studies all around the world, and it just shows that empirically, similarity is indeed the norm for spouse, between spouses, husbands and wives, or for that matter, best friends. Um, and the similarity is highest for social demographic variables, age and sex, and, I mean age and race and religion and social class background, very high indeed. It's next most high for attitudes and opinions, next highest for IQ and cognitive ability, and then low positive uh, but still significant for physical characteristics and for personality. And I'll just draw your attention perhaps to the uh, two, two of these differences, and that's political attitudes. Um, a lot of geneticists and sociobiologists like myself have perhaps over-concentrated on IQ and IQ differences between groups. In fact, it's probably vastly more important for you and your best friend, or for you and your spouse, not to be exactly the same in terms of intelligence, but you don't want to be too dissimilar in terms of social attitudes. I mean, your attitude towards AR, for example, should probably be not dramatically different from your spouse's or your best friend's, or there's going to be a certain amount of tension uh, within the family, to say the least, or at least non-communication. So actually, social attitudes and opinions turn out to be more important for spouses and best friends than even does cognitive ability. Um, the question, though, is, and most sociologists would say, well, yes, these similarity dimensions that I've been talking about, everybody knows about them, but it's all due to cultural factors. It's all due to educational level or some kind of social assortment due to cultural factors. And so now the question becomes, how do I show that it's due to genetics? Uh, I'm sorry about this slide, it's rather technical, you can't really read it, but it's up there to at least show that I do have actual data. I haven't done any DNA studies myself. Uh, when I did the studies um, in the 1980s, looking at similarity between sexually interacting couples and between spouse and um, between best friends, I used uh, blood tests, which is an old-fashioned technology by today's standards. Uh, but these blood tests that I used, there were ten, 10 blood loci across six different chromosomes. They are sufficiently powerful to, in fact, uh, de determine whether a particular child. Uh, was or was not the offspring of a particular male. Uh, so they were used in paternity testing. And without telling you which numbers go with what, I'll just essentially tell you the results of this study. We looked at a thousand sexually interacting couples who produced a child together. And we found that those sexually interacting couples were genetically more similar using these blood loci than were random couples taken from the same sample. And this wasn't due to ethnicity because the study was limited to people of North European appearance as judged by photographs. Uh, at the very bottom of this particular slide, uh, there's a friendship study. We actually brought in 70 or 80 pairs of friends, best friends, into the laboratory. We gave them all kinds of tests. We drew blood and we tested up the blood loci. And what we found was that best friends are genetically more similar to each other than are random pairs from that same sample. So on the straightforward standard uh, empirical question, are spouses, are best friends actually genetically similar to each other? The answer is an absolutely clear yes. But even that's not really the interesting question. The question is why? Could the tendency itself to choose similarity be heritable? Is that a genetic urge in everybody? Can we in fact, I will argue we can, each of us in this room can look around, look at everybody else in this room, and in some unconscious way calculate the degree of relatedness, the degree of genetic similarity between ourselves and everybody else in the room. And we have a slight tendency to prefer those who are genetically similar to ourselves rather than those who are genetically different from ourselves. And I think the next set of slides is going to try and prove this. They're, again, they're rather complicated, and I apologize for it, but I'll just briefly give you the overview, and that you can read the I should tell you that each of the studies that I'm referring to has been published in a scientific, peer-reviewed journal, 
uh, mostly in the light, late 1980s and early 1990s. Most of the studies that I'm going to talk about were done by me, but there are other confirmations that have been done by other scientists, and you can look up the literature uh, if you're interested. This is a long list of physical traits. Uh, things like your size of your wrist, the size of your calf, the size of your neck, your chest, your waist, and so on. The length of your finger, the length of your earlobe. And what you find in the first column of numbers is the similarity scores. And this is the degree to which spouses actually resemble one another uh, in those traits. And the resemblances are relatively low. And there's the important point to note is that the resemblances, the similarity scores vary. There's a certain amount of variation. We're more similar to our spouses on some traits rather than others. For example, we happen to be more similar on wrist size than we are on the size of our calf. Now, so what? Look at the last column. The last column is the heritability of the specific item. How much is that particular trait genetically penetrated? And if you think about it intuitively, it's obvious that the size of your wrist is more genetically influenced than is the size of your bicep. You can work out with exercise and increase or decrease the size of your bicep. But there isn't a whole lot you can do about the size of your wrist. Some traits are more heritable than other traits. And what you find if you correlate those two columns of numbers together, is that you find there's a positive correlation. That means that spouses are actually picking each other on the basis of the most genetically penetrated traits, not the culturally penetrated traits. Not only does it support genetic similarity theory, it argues against cultural theory. Culture theory would tell you that you marry somebody and, and adopt a lifestyle like your spouse. You turn into couch potatoes and eat too many chocolates and put on something around the middle, or you uh, take up bicycling and uh, you build up your calf sizes together, uh, and that would suggest that you become more similar to one another on the basis of the culturally influenced traits. But in fact, that is not empirically what happens. You're more similar on the genetically penetrated traits. And if you turn to the next slide, this is a study of friends rather than spouses, but the same relationships apply. And this is a bit odd because it's social attitudes. And most people think that social attitudes have nothing to do with genetics at all. But in fact, they do. It's a genetic penetrance to even social attitudes you have. What you've got here is a long list of different social attitudes. You either have to say yes or no, you're in favor or you're not in favor of a variety of traits like Jazz, do you like it or not? Conventional clothing, do you like it or not? Um, observing the Sabbath, yes or no? And of course what you find is that best friends, on average, are more similar to each other on those traits than um, are random people. Similarity, not opposites attract. But the important point is that the similarity between best friends is greatest on the most heritable of those social attitudes. The more genetically penetrated the trait, the more similar the friends are. Turn to the next slide. These are just empirical studies, and I just want to uh, show you that there's a number of them. This is personality. Again, it's just a string of numbers. I'm sorry I didn't have time to make more attractive or, or sim simpler slides. Um, these are personality traits, and again, you've got similarity scores. This time, again, you've got two different ways of estimating or guesstimating, some would argue, the heritabilities. Once again, you find that in personality, best friends and spouses are more similar the more genetically penetrated the personality item. So it's true across all the different types of measures that we've taken. We can go to the next one. Now, it might seem odd that human beings can calculate the degrees of genetic relatedness between themselves and in fact choose spouses and best friends on the basis of the more genetically inherited traits. But in fact, very, very simple organisms can do it. This capacity and in fact desire to, to mate with somebody sim similar to oneself occurs 
all the way down the phylogen phylogenetic scale. Insects prefer similarity, or many species of insects do. Birds do, other mammals do, even plants do. For evolution to work to create social assortment based on genetic similarity many, many times over in separate independent evolutionary events means that that trait confers fitness benefits. In other words, it helps replicate genes. It would never have evolved because it's costly. It would never have evolved if it wasn't adaptive. This particular study that I put up is a study of guard bees, uh, uh, of sweat bees. So the way sweat bees operate is you have a hive. There's a small opening to the hive. There is a guard bee that stands by the hive door. It's a big bee, and it blocks the hive entrance with its body. And it looks out. And when it sees another bee coming towards the hive, it makes a decision to move its body out of the way and let the bee in or not let the bee in. And it does this over and over and over again. In this particular experiment done by Greenberg in 1979 and published in Science, an absolute classic now in this field, he experimentally bred for degrees of relatedness to the guard bee. And he found that line that you see going up there like just a straight line is essentially evidence that the closer the degree of genetic relatedness there was to the guard bee, the more likely the guard bee was to let the other bee in. For our purposes, what you need to see is that even bees, complex though they may be, they're incredibly simple organisms by comparison with humans. In terms of the nervous system and the brain, it doesn't compare uh, with even ground squirrels or the size and complexity of our brain. And yet these bees have hardwired the capacity to discriminate degrees of genetic relatedness to itself and to prefer those who are similar, to act altruistically to those who are similar. We can go to the next slide. This is a ground squirrel. This particular ground squirrel is at the moment uh, barking an alarm call. It is standing up on its hind legs, somewhere in the Nevada desert perhaps, and uh, it spotted an eagle. An eagle will come down and prey upon this ground squirrel. It's putting itself in danger. What it should really do is dive for cover. But the very fact that it's standing up on its hind legs and barking, warning all the other ground squirrels in the vicinity to take cover is an act of altruism. And the question for evolutionists, Charles Darwin posed the problem in 1870, and he said, how did evolution evolve? I mean, how did altruism evolve? It seems to go against the theory of evolution. The theory of evolution seems to be that you as an individual are selfish. Look out for yourself. If you survive, survival of the fittest, replicate your individual genes, this is the way natural selection works. The devil take the hindmost. So how does altruism, helping behavior, kindness to others, possibly evolve as an adaptation? And the simple answer, which wasn't really solved satisfactorily until about the 1960s, uh, is altruism. It is that altruism benefits genes. But you share genes. You share genes not only with your immediate family, but even with more extended family. And this ground squirrel, is in fact far more likely to stand up on its hind legs, experimental evidence, when the squirrels around it, that surround it at any particular point in time, are genetic relatives. In fact, the more genetically related they are to this ground squirrel, the more likely it is to stand up. And if you go to the other extreme and put genetically unrelated individuals there, it will not stand up and give an altruistic signal. And this ground squirrel's capacity for discrimination, fine distinctions, uh, is quite marked. In fact, ground squirrels are promiscuous, and the female will be impregnated by maybe two different males, and it will have a litter of perhaps eight little squirrels, four of whom are uh, full siblings, and fathered by one male, four of whom are essentially half siblings to the other four, fathered by a different male. Even the siblings, 
are able to discriminate among themselves as to who is a full sibling that is sharing 50% of their genes, I mean 50% of their genes, and who is a half sibling sharing only 25% of their genes. Agonistic interactions are much more among the half siblings than among the full siblings. And there are a lot of experimental studies in the animal sociobiology literature that support this. Um, we can move to the next one. Of course, when, by the time you get up to chimpanzees, a very, very sociable animal, uh, the capacity for uh, discrimination, social discriminations, and so on, uh, become quite remarkable. And when you come to humans, as shown in the bottom slide, uh, with Jane Goodall there gazing almost lovingly at this chimpanzee and you will know from many of you that Jane Goodall is an animal rights activist and some people would say she prefers animals more than she does people. We know that with humans the capacity for altruism really can take on uh, a level of ethical altruism that is universal and beyond even the human species. So I'm not trying to suggest that this desire for your own relatives is in a, a totally animalistic, bee-like manner for humans. Uh, in fact, with humans and even chimpanzees, uh, social learning, a lot of social learning takes place. Um, and uh, obviously, as the case with Jane Goodall, extended altruism well beyond the kinship group is possible. But nonetheless, the basic impulses I'm arguing uh, stem out of uh, genetic similarity and altruism. We turn to the, la uh, the next slide. <laughs> These uh, ch are two chimpanzees looking extremely menacing. In fact, they are menacing, they're about to kill. Uh, Jane Goodall was absolutely shocked to find, after 20 or 30 years of research, that these chimpanzees engage in war. We know a lot more about chimpanzee politics in the last 10 to 15 years, and it's not a pretty sight. Uh, the young males go out like this in groups, and they hunt. They hunt other young males, and they hunt uh, members of adjoining tribes. They chase them up trees. They strategize how to bring them out of that tree, and then they beat them up for 10 minutes at a time until their necks are broken and they die. And in the process, they expand their own territory. They increase their own genes. And if they don't, then marauding males of the other neighboring tribes come in and do it to them. It's a kill or be kill uh, existence. It's an expand or contract existence. So it's altruism within the group and enmity outside of the group. Now, these arguments were very well known throughout the 19th century. Charles Darwin, uh, Herbert Spencer, all the uh, 19th century evolutionists. And again, it's like, uh, well, basically like the brain size and IQ uh, literature that I've spoken about on other occasions. All scientists knew this right up until the 1930s. Most scientists knew this up until the 1930s, or at least until the turn of the century. Today, and this is probably the only time in science that I know of, in which things in a democracy, in which things have, that were once, quote, known to the scientific community, have been made to disappear from that same scientific community. It is not the case, ladies and gentlemen, that scientists know the truth, but don't want to tell you. The fact of the matter is that the vast majority of scientists don't know the truth. And they don't know the truth because when they were trained any time in the last 20 to 30 years, the introductory psychology or introductory textbooks that they read told them, the law, uh, told them untruths. And every professor in every course that they had all the way through their PhDs told them untruths. And so it's not the case that all my colleagues really know the truth but don't want to tell you. The fact of the matter is that if you took a survey of most of my colleagues, they would say that I, I was clear that I was mistaken and people uh, Professor Whitney and uh, other people who've spoken here. Uh, you have to judge for yourself what the empirical evidence shows. Um, so I've previously spoken about race differences. This is not a race difference that I'm talking about. This is part of human nature. All ethnic groups have genes, or all people have genes that 
predispose them, on average, to prefer their own kind. <coughs> because it is a mechanism by which genes replicate. If you help copies of your genes to replicate, your genes replicate. If, in fact, you hate copies of your own genes and go around killing them off wherever you see them, if nature produced such an aberration, your genes would disappear. It's very simple to do uh, a little mo uh, imaginary modeling in your mind as to imagine three different scenarios. Either there are genes for kin selection or ethnic identity, there are not, or in fact the opposite is true. There are genes for killing your own kind. Imagine five generations or ten generations from now which kind of genes are in the world in a greater percentage. Clearly, it will be the genes for altruism, for recognizing similar others, for discriminating against dissimilar others, and for preferring your own kind. Nepotism is the name we give to it. And it's not family nepotism, it's ethnic nepotism. And indeed, uh, apart from uh, historical moments, we're not surprised if when Sikhs come to the United States and set up a business, they uh, do business with other Sikhs. Or when other ethnic groups uh, come, Koreans, that they immediately gravitate and form social networks with other Koreans. This is true throughout history in all other parts of the world and it makes perfectly good sense. It doesn't just make good sense for the individual selfish point of view because he gets along better with them and can trust them better. It makes broader evolutionary sense. By acting in this way, he will more likely increase copies of his own genes in the future. Now, the last. This is an ethnic map of the world. Uh, it was just taken out of the most recent Scientific American. And uh, perhaps the only thing to really read from this is to look at the yellows, uh, the, the, or whatever the greeny yellow color is, uh, let's say, for example, in Africa. Uh, that particular color shows that there is very little ethnic homogeneity. There's masses and masses of ethnic differences. The predictions from what I've said today would be that the more ethnically diverse a country, the more warfare and tensions and uncooperation there will be. But the more ethnically homogenous a country is, the more cooperation there will be, the more within group altruism can easily follow. Um, well, do the predictions in fact hold up? Uh, yes and no. If you look at Africa, there's no question that there's most genetic uh, um, heterogeneity there, and there is the most tribal conflict and warfare of anywhere else in the world that is going on in Africa. But, and this must be a very important caution, if you look at India, if you look at the Indian subcontinent, you will see that ethnically it too is extremely heterogeneous. And yet, certainly for the last 50 or 60 years, India with nearly a billion people has maintained itself as a relatively speaking peaceful, stable democracy. So there is no absolute necessity here for uh, ethnic uh, tribalism to immediately launch into warfare. Just as, and it makes sense if you think about it at the individual level, each of us is genetically distinct from each other. In a sense, from an evolutionary point of view, my genes are in competition with your genes to replicate into the next generation. But this never occurs to us. We don't think of it that way. And there's no need for individuals to go out killing each other any more than there are for groups to go out killing each other. Um, so the final kind of, um, oh, I suppose I should point out that in this particular context of ethnic homogeneity, heterogeneity, the United States and Canada are in fact somewhere in the middle as far as the world as a whole is concerned, slightly more homogenous than most of the world is, which is just something to think about. Um, and the final thought before we can open it up for questions is that all I'm really trying to say is that this is not a genetic imperative within us. Uh, another sociobiologist has used the word whisperings from within. And maybe that's too soft. But it's somewhere between a whisper, a genetic 
whisper and a genetic imperative, but it is not genetically neutral. This is a tendency within humans to recognize uh, genetic similarity and to prefer it, and it forms the basis, I think, of ethnic identity. Thanks very much. Yes. subject of a symposium at the Smithsonian called Lessons from a Primitive People uh, about 10, 20 years ago. Um, Neil was a student of Marshall Salins who said that there was, that kinship is a, is a fiction. He and um, his uh, associate did Geneva, familiar related studies, I think before DNA studies, of the groups in the Yanomami that had axe fights and fissioned off into new groups, and he found that they were that those who uh, left were more related to each other than to the group they had left. So you already know that. Okay. And you know the work of Thomas Sowell, the Black Economist, describing uh, 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 that uh, he's the only person who, who has a nice word to say about every ethnic group, even Germans. Uh, so. Do you have a question? Yes, my question is. Uh, that perhaps people don't have the uh, quick instincts to find each other, but the contrary, that um, these other animals do. Could they consciously be, uh, use DNA studies, the more detailed they become, to find each other, to find affinity groups in the future? Okay. Uh, the, the first part of the statement was uh, providing additional evidence uh, that I did. Uh, that I was aware of in favor of the genetic similarity theory model. Uh, she referred to the Yanomamo done in Brazil, uh, an Indian tribe which splits off and fissions. And um, what they find is that when a village fissions and splits into two, uh, what happens is that the, the two groups tend to be genetically very similar to each other, are more similar uh, and different from the other groups. So that they actually are splitting along genetic similarity lines. Uh, or kinship lines, and this was a classic series of studies done in uh, physical anthropology or social anthropology. But the question was, uh, did I think that DNA uh, might be used more effectively in the future to um, uh, help find uh, soulmates or, or at least similar others? And I, I think that a computer dating service that said to you, uh, you can find a woman uh, who is, say, or a man, a spouse, a person who is uh, 25% as similar as you are, uh, but not actually a relative. Um, I think there'd be a lot of takers for that. Uh, you should know, of course, you probably do know, that in many, many societies, uh, cousin marriages, far from being banned, are indeed encouraged. That people, and a lot of animal studies seem to say that the optimal choice, uh, many males would like many partners, but uh, some partners more frequently than others. And the partner that is chosen the most frequently uh, would be those who are genetically about the same uh, distance away as a first cousin is, but who is not actually a first cousin, so then you don't get the inbreeding depression and the results from it. Anyway, uh, another question, Paul Crom. What you say is extremely encouraging, but uh, how do you explain the, the dysgenic behavior that we've heard about so so much? Yeah, how do I explain if genetic uh, similarity and replication of a genes is a genetic whisper or genetic imperative, how can people behave in such a suicidal manner? Um, I, I've thought about this too, and I don't have a definitive answer, but the best answer I can come up with is to look at individual psychology. I don't think this has anything to do with uh, people today being genetically less good than they were before, or spinelessness, or anything like this. I think it's to do with the fact that we've evolved to basically follow the leader. Um, uh, we want to be liked, and we don't want to be disliked. We live in social groups, we're a social animal, we learn many of our social attitudes. We want to do what's good and right, and we don't really know always what's good and right. So we simply look at people who are genetically similar to ourselves, uh, people who look like Ronald Reagan, Bill Clinton, Jimmy Carter, Richard Nixon, 
uh, Dwight Eisenhower, John Kennedy, these are the presidents, the TV anchorman, Peter Jennings. We look at these people and we say, well, there's somebody just like me and or my brother and uh, he's telling me such and such. And that's very, very powerful. It's very difficult for us to say to our, lead, our tribal leaders, our heads of our families, the way we, we, we are genetically structuring this, that's BS, that's nonsense. And then when we also hear from all the other sources of importance that we would normally consider valuable from the media, from the pulpit, from the school system, even from our peer group, the same story, it's very difficult to say no. And I suspect that what happens is that there are a few people who are slightly uh, higher than average on something like autonomy or independence or uh, clear thinkingness perhaps. People like obviously uh, me and my audience um, <laughs> question the received wisdom and want to think it through for ourselves. And then we come to slightly different conclusions. But for the majority of people, uh, what is right and wrong is to some extent what their neighbors are doing. And if their neighbors are doing um, what they are doing, then that's the way it works. So if you have control, uh, I mean, this, does, this can work for good or bad, depending on what your politics are. I mean, if Hitler comes to power and says, go to war, then the Germans being good uh, followers all go to war. And if the leaders come along and say, uh, you know, uh, practice democracy and let many immigrants in, then the Germans, being good followers, practice democracy and let the um, uh, foreigners in. And there's nothing mysterious about it at the level of the individual psychology. It's the same process each time. And I don't think it's unique to North Europeans or to uh, uh, people in North America. I think the Japanese, in a way, are doing half of what we're doing. That is, they're not having any children. The average Japanese uh, uh, family is something like 1.3 children. China, they're having a one-child policy imposed by the government. They are, in a sense, not behaving in a simple sociobiological maximization process of having trillions of children and taking over the world with them, which would be what you would think might follow from a, a very simple analysis. Now, it's true that the Japanese are not allowing in um, uh, many, many immigrants, which is a, con a, a cause of concern uh, to AR audiences, but uh, many other countries are. The Russians are, for example. Even the Israelis are. Uh, the South Africans are. Uh, so it is not something that is specifically unique to North America or even to uh, Europe. Uh, it is um, these ideas, crazy ideas even, pathological ideas almost, can and do come and go, and there's a whole literature on how you can have genetic transmission on the one hand and social transmission, cultural transmission on the other hand, and how do these two things interact and have gene culture co-evolution. But anyway, uh, that's the best answer I can give to that problem. Yes? Uh, that's a question. identity or social identity that we construct for ourselves is a construction. Uh, there's no doubt about it that we can uh, reconstruct and re-identify. I mean, there are concentric circles going outside of yourself and what you consider to be your own nation or included in your own nation can change rapidly. And then we have to use a lot of socialization terms like brothers and sisters and um, uh, the motherland and the fatherland and uh, in order to build this sense of kinship. And exactly who's included and who's not is to a large extent negotiable and flexible and changes. 
Um, and the, the identity that we construct doesn't even have to be positive. Um, I think that uh, people were talking earlier this morning about how whites um, almost hate themselves as a result of internalizing things from the media. And this may be true, and uh, anecdotally or sociologically it has been said that in earlier times uh, Jewish identity was often self-hating because that it assimilated uh, some of the uh, disdain of the wider community. That black groups historically have hated themselves because they identified with the conception they have of themselves that the white slave masters or the white majority had of them. So I don't think, even though that there's a genetic whisper and desire to construct an identity, the, uh, the positive and negative cues and components of that identity um, have to be picked from the culture. And uh, it, it can lead to some complexities. I'm not, I'm not sure I answered your question, but let's take a question from, yes. Do you, uh, do you have any idea in your research on any possible ways to trigger uh, that ethnic uh, identification and perhaps European Americans? I mean, imagine the volume of this research you've done. Is there any ideas you might have of how to, how to trigger that reaction or to, uh, to make, maybe bring that reaction out from your biological studies? Uh, the question is how to, um, how would one increase ethnic solidarity and ethnic nationalism and indeed, let's say, reproduction of babies? Um, I think the answer is quite simple um, and it's not from my research, it's almost common sense. Uh, Joseph Goebbels, of course, had complete control of the media in Germany and the German birth rate shot up and uh, German nationalism shot up and ethnic solidarity uh, uh, increased and outgroup hatred increased and the reason was because of the images being displayed on television. He took, if you, if you saw today, I'm sure on television, which you will not, lots and lots of nice blue-eyed blonde babies being born and women uh, who had lots of these babies being happy uh, having babies and wanting to stay at home and not to work, then you would in fact increase the number of women who would want to have babies and want to stay at home. Uh, if you showed attractive people uh, standing up to drive uh, the drug dealers out of their neighborhood uh, and not care what race they were, uh, e even if they were a different race, um, then I think that uh, many more people in suburban neighborhoods would rally together to drive out the, um, the alien drug dealers. And so what you see on TV, the images, the attitudes, the values that you see portrayed, especially portrayed by role models who look like you, and that's Advertisers know this. Politicians know this. Uh, when they, if you're running for Congress, uh, you get uh, workers who are, you get black workers to go and knock on black neighborhoods. You get uh, Hispanic voters to go on and knock on Hispanic doors. You get uh, you know, blue-eyed blonde workers to go and knock in on the suburban doors and so on and so forth. We know that the ethnic person you're interacting with helps sell whatever the product is that you're selling because people would much, they trust a person uh, who, is, who looks like their cousin. More than they look, they trust somebody who um, looks very, very different on average. Yeah, at the back. Yes, uh, Sir Arthur Keith uh, has quite a different theory than you presenting. He said simply that if an evolutionary unit is under great stress, specifically under the threat of annihilation, the dual code is evoked in males to the point where the male will sacrifice himself for his group. And in females, uh, the birth rate shoots up. Now, if we look at the Palestinians in the West, West Bank, we see a perfect example. We have all these young males willing to, to die for their cause, and the, the female birth rate, uh, live birth, birth rate per female is 8.8 children. What do you think of Sir Arthur Keith's um, The question is about Sir Arthur Keith. Um, well, I, I won't get into the, the, the details of the differences between my position or other people's positions and Arthur Keith's positions and so on. Certainly Arthur Keith was a great man in the sense that he, he was an evolutionist. He was at least able to identify some of the problems like ethnic solidarity, like when people would go to war and when they wouldn't, uh, like whether some groups survived more than others, whether it was a process called
selection and so on, and that there, were, there may be ethnic differences in personality and temperament. Uh, these were aspects that Sir Arthur Keith was in fact willing to address, and for that I, I, I think he's a great man and I, I, I share similarities with him. I think the particulars of his theory uh, we've improved on, but those are, those are fighting words and we can have a debate about it. As far as uh, why the Palestinians are having so many children and why their people are fighting, um, I, I don't think it's got anything to do with evolutionary selection pressures quite so much as the kind of social learning and the micro uh, um, society of the human individual brain. You, all of us, live in a peer group, a small group of people that are important to us, five or six, 10, 12 people at, at the most, perhaps, our family. What they think is what's important. And uh, somebody else earlier this morning was talking about some ethnic groups, uh, uh, it was Dr. Gottfried was saying that some ethnic groups, uh, blue collar, uh, Catholics and so on, do not seem to be as susceptible to the self-destructive urges as, say, um, uh, German Protestants are. Um, I, I don't think there's any difference in this between uh, Italian Catholics and German Protestants. I think what the difference is, is uh, in, in the sense that their minds work, I think the difference is, is the peer groups that these particular individuals are within. Um, Italians still live in peer groups that where it, being an Italian and being a Catholic, even if it's only important for the grandmother, it's still therefore important for the family. Uh, whereas German Protestants, it's not even important for the grand, grandparents. Yes? In regard to altruism, if we were to compare, for instance, say the, the, the white altruism, which seems to be, I would call it more maybe on a positive scale, where we'll, we'll undertake cooperative ventures with each other and in peacetime, whereas most non-white groups tend to be not really that altruistic until they're under a threat, as, as we see in some of the war records, say the black troops in the wars when they'll run off from battle, or uh, Bhopal, India, where the guy runs 50 miles before he falls back and says the plant's about to blow up. There's not the same sense, except in kind of a survival mode, whereas whites tend to be more altruistic in peacetime and without a direct threat. Have you seen any genetic relationship, or would that help explain why we may have gone overboard with altruism towards the whole world? Uh, the degree of the universality of um, altruism at the moment, and the way that uh, Western nations um, give aid to Africa, the Caribbean, or to blacks in Detroit, for that matter, without counting, without calling them to be responsible in terms of uh, reproduction, re reproductive habits, is a bit of a mystery. Um, but uh, my main point here is that altruism is much more likely to occur within an ethnic group. Uh, the Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims who live in the United States or Canada are far more likely to give money to the Red Crescent or to, to Hamas or to their own uh, organizations than they are to say, uh, save the children in Africa. Um, blacks are far more likely to give money uh, to black causes. Um, uh, Sikhs from India are far more likely to uh, give money to radical Sikh uh, political causes. In other words, when you do give money, most ethnic groups are much more likely, an individual person is far more likely to give it to a charity that benefits his own ethnic group than he is to give it to uh, very distant um, ethnic groups. Don't Although that much, does occur. Don't we have a much higher rate of altruism among whites? For instance, the, the donation to charitable groups, blacks are, of course, are very low in that, even among their own groups, whereas we are very high. Uh, the question is whether there are also levels of altruism differences. And yes, I think whites are more altruistic than blacks are. Yes? Just, just a comment. Uh, in Bosnia, the Serbs went through the Croatian and the uh, Muslim areas. They separated all the men, threw them in a slammer, and then raped all the women so that they would be pregnant with Serbian children. And I read a very interesting footnote when uh, they captured one of the officers, a Serbian officer, when they were still fighting over there, and who was photographed. So they knew who the guy was, so they were asking him on 
respect of people's ethnic future. Because they believe so much in the family and the ethnic foundation that that child, three, four generations later, is going to be looked at as a negative in their society. The, uh, that the reason, the question is, why do men uh, rape the women of um, out, out, out groups? And whatever the justification of the rapist may be, the real answer is, and he may not be aware of it, the real answer is evolution. Uh, ducks do it. Uh, uh, chimpanzees do it. Uh, that is, if you can kill the males of the rival uh, uh, group and impregnate their females. Uh, you will in fact replicate your genes much more effectively and that's why rape uh, is an evolved strategy uh, which is another politically incorrect statement. <laughs> Resources. I mean, the, the worst fights you have are within a family. I mean, the worst fight you ever have is with your brother, and brothers do kill brothers, and they over kill their fathers, and so on. Um, and these kind of wars are, do occur, and uh, they're the worst of all kinds uh, in some ways. But uh, this is probably something to do with the simple geography of the situation of scarce resources. Um, if you and your, if only you and your brother can survive, you or your brother can survive in one particular situation. You and your brother will have to fight it out in order to survive in that particular situation. Um, I mean, that's not a very neat answer, but I would suggest that if you could actually uh, experimentally create antagonism between people, it would be much easier to create that antagonism uh, between genetically dissimilar people than it will be to create the antagonism towards genetically similar people. And that certainly isn't to say that the British couldn't hate the Germans and the Germans couldn't hate the British because they certainly did and in some cases still do. Um, so that's, there are many conflicting factors going on. Yeah. 